Welcome all to the Volvo Awareness Day webinar 2023. Um, I'm so glad to have you all with us today. Thank you so much for signing in. I'll make a quick introduction. I'm Chulu Alidikpe. I'm a consultant of Zangaini and senior honorary um, lecturer at the Hull York Medical School in Hull, United Kingdom, with a specialist interest area in vulvar disease, ambulatory gynecology, pulposcopy, complex obstetrics, and preterm birth with psychosexual medicine. But very quickly, I'm also the co-chair of the Volvo Awareness Day Committee, uh, which up until now has produced several activities and initiatives creating vulvar disease awareness over the last 10 months. I'm the co-organizer of the 2023 Volvo Awareness Day webinars. Thank you so much for joining in, for logging in, um, staying here with us with at the ISSVD commemorating the Awareness Day, which is an annual day we set aside every year to further deliberate on vulvar disease. The theme this year is Volvo Vaginitis and welcome on board. There'll be two parts to this webinar. The first part will be for the clinicians and the second part will be for patients and their carers. So without further ado, I'll start with the clinician webinar by introducing members of the panel. Firstly, I'll introduce Professor Jack Subal, who is a global expert in bacterial vaginosis. He's a distinguished professor of medicine is the Dean Emeritus of Wayne State University School of Medicine in Michigan, US of A. So, Prof Sobel, thank you so much for joining us today, despite your very busy schedule and also despite the very short notice. I will take time introducing members of the panel one after the other, but I will go straight into the topic, if that's all right. Um, so please, Prof. Sabo, do you want to give us a little bit of a, uh, uh, should I say, an overview on bacterial vaginosis, given how much of a major problem it is with the variable prevalence and, you know, different understanding of its pathophysiology? Thank you. So you start off with the $5 billion question. Okay, so bacterial vaginosis is by far the most common vaginal infection uh, worldwide, affecting all continents on this planet, affecting women of all social um, <clears throat> strata, and um, it is a bacterial infection. It differs from all other infections in being a polymicrobial infection, consisting uh, <clears throat> resulting in a clinical syndrome and the uh, multiple pathogens that are involved in its etiopathogenesis are all anaerobes. And uh, these organisms, um, initially, we believe the dominant reason for the development of this infection is sexual transmission. So the evidence in favor of a sexual etiology or pathogenesis for the very first infection is likely to be sexual transmission. to some controversy, but the evidence is overwhelming. And the two organisms that are thought to be most relevant to the initiation of the infection are Gonorrhea vaginalis and uh, Prevotella species. And these organisms, there are many uh, different, what we call clades of Gonorrhea. Not all of them are virulent, not all of them are pathogenic, many, many subspecies or clades, and these organisms um, initiate the infection, during which there's, uh, they, they create the environment for the overgrowth of many other anaerobes. They create a biofilm, which is critical to the pathogenesis of bacterial vaginosis, uh, which is a matrix layer of, of <clears throat> different substances which totally covers the, the vaginal mucosa or epithelial surface and contains the various bacteria that contribute to the infection, and which is dominated by Gardnerella vaginalis. As a result of the infection, we end up with a, a symptomatic clinical syndrome characterized by an abnormal discharge, which is malodorous, and they are usually minimal other symptoms, but what is strikingly different from many other forms of vaginitis Rarely do you find dyspareunia, pain, 
etc. What is most important about this clinical syndrome is its capacity to have complications. And the complications, most people are aware of its importance in pregnancy as an important and indis <clears throat> indisputable cause of preterm labor, prematurity, polyamnionitis. Yes, undoubtedly. But there are many other complications, including certain gynecologic infections, post-surgical, vaginal cuff infections, much more relevant, however, in terms of its significance, is it predisposes with this total change in the vaginal, what we used to call bacterial flora, now called microbiota. The entire vaginal microbiome is altered, and it creates an environment that facilitates and contributes to the secondary acquisition of sexually transmitted infections, most important of which is HIV. So if you had to to put your finger on why it is so relevant worldwide, it is not only because it causes symptoms and causes major problems in its own right, but the complication rate, most importantly, I'm um, just focusing now is HIV transmission throughout Africa and other country, other continents as well, is primarily the result of bacterial vaginosis. Control bacterial vaginosis, you take a giant step towards controlling HIV transmission. So that's just by way of introduction. Wow. Just a little topic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, I mean, every time I listen to you, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> So, but very, there's very a, there, there's a, a very good issue. I think that perhaps it could be interesting to discuss it: sexual transmission or sexual activity mm -hmm. of of bacterial vaginosis. It's related both to sexual activity. Sexual activity is important in that sexual activity, normal coitus, normal intercourse, is a frequent. Uh, a precipitating factor in terms of the appearance of symptoms. So women will notice the onset of symptomatology, the malodorous vaginal discharge very shortly after intercourse. It may the same thing may happen during menses, but that's sexual trans. Uh, but the sexual activity precipitates symptomatology, which is different from sexual transmission. Thank what you. about with oral? What about with oral sex or masturbation? Do you get that same? I'm curious. No, I think that's an excellent question, um, and it's relevant. It's it's particularly relevant when you deal when dealing with someone who has recurrent bacterial vaginosis. One of the most important therapeutic challenges is trying to understand the causation of recurrent bacterial vaginosis, in other words, repeated recurring episodes of all the symptomatology, which may or may not, but frequently responds to therapy, all the traditional therapy that we have at hand, control symptomatology, patients become asymptomatic, feel better, the traditional signs and symptoms we use, especially laboratory criteria, will actually resolve, and then recurrence occurs. So recurrence can be sexual transmission, but may also be relapse. Relapse implies that you don't need any sexual factors to trigger the recurrence of symptomatology and the full syndrome. So whether you have, and you cannot distinguish clinically, a practitioner cannot distinguish between relapse and reinfection. It's the same disease, it's the same entity, we may eventually, we're using molecular techniques, be able to fingerprint the molecular differences between relapse and reinfection, but currently cannot. So when a woman complains of and presents with repeated and recurring bouts of, vaginal, of bacterial vaginosis, we're in no position to say this is happening because of reinfection or relapse, unless she is celibate. If she's celibate, then these are purely relapses. But you asked your, your first question related to the role of oral sex. There is minimal evidence because we don't routinely uh, spend much time 
uh, delving into the sexuality issues, sex issues, as far as the role of oral sex. Nobody has <clears throat> provided substantial evidence that oral sex, receptive oral sex, is a major factor in the causation of BV, but it's not studied. We don't know. And if we don't know, we don't stand on a soapbox and shout to the world, do this or do that. We wait in silence until the studies are done. So we do know that code, you know, uh, unprotected, unprotected intercourse without a, without a condom is a major transmission factor and responsible for a significant number of recurrences. And that varies by population. So what you may see in Australia may, in terms of recurrences versus relapse may be very different from Africa, which may be different from North America. So the actual relative percentages of relapse versus recurrences, the majority, you know, and um, it varies by patient and by population. There's a question here talking about relapse tends to occur around the menstrual period. So the question is, is this a relapse or is it just an infection? No, no. The symptoms appear during menses and shortly thereafter, almost never premenstrual. And that's because during menstruation, the presence of blood forms a wonderful growth medium for the anaerobes that may be quietly nesting in the, in the vagina and the, with the appearance of blood and iron and a variety of other components of the menstrual. Uh, you actually provide the nutritional support for these bacteria, they overgrow. It is well known that with normal menstruation, we tend to find about a log decrease, decrease in the normal protective lactobacillus species normally. So if you actually do careful quantitative longitudinal studies, you tend to find a decrease in lactobacillus species during menses. That factor, together with the overgrowth of anaerobes, and that's clearly an interrelated event, results in from the, uh, is the trigger for the appearance of the symptoms during menses. During intercourse, similar changes do occur without, without the appearance of blood, but firstly, if there's, if one has the arrival of semen, the change in the pH of semen, the vaginal pH changes during the intercourse. Moreover, intercourse is not a totally benign entity in that one can document inflammatory changes occurring during the menses. So if you do very careful, thorough studies of the cytokine profile, during and after inter intercourse, you will find that the environment changes and it may be subtle, but enough to trigger an attack of, of uh, symptomatology, the BV flares immediately following intercourse. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's answered the second question from um, Dr. Gomberg. Great. I, the other thing I was going to ask is, for well, the relapse of the, should I say, the refractory BV, what would be your preferred, should I say, intervention, apart from medication, particularly looking at, you know, biofilm creation or minimizing the biofilm? So um, I think we sort of uh, table our, our treatment, man treatment factors into prevention and then treatment. As far as prevention is concerned, clearly the use of, of a condom is a, is a major factor in preventing both uh, certainly the first episode and recurrences. And the, it, there's really excellent sexual transmission data, mainly originating from the, the Melbourne group in Australia. But um, so prevention, there's something to be done. Other than that, uh, there's not an awful lot that can be done to prevent uh, the first episode, what about preventing recurrences? So you look for potentially preventable uh, contributory factors. For example, the copper IUD has been associated with recurrent bacterial versus, mm -hmm. bacterial vaginosis, as has smoking, heavy chronic smoking. Uh, and there are a lot of theories as to why this, the smoking factor is relevant. 
the IUD is probably a function of two factors, the formation of, an, of a biofilm on the, on the IUD strings. And the more important than that is the fact that many women who have an IUD will spot. And if you're spotting, it's subclinical, it doesn't bother anybody, but the period of the recurring appearance of blood into the vagina just is perpetuating the existence of the bacterial pathogens within the vagina. So when you come now to, re to treatment of a sporadic first episode, the, you know, the CDC or any professional society worldwide, the traditional therapies are largely uh, consistent and not controversial. So whether you're using a nitroimidazole or such as metronidazole, secnetazole, tinidazole, will depend on, on insurance factors and what's available. Clearly metronidazole is the the uh, available and it's usually prescribed initially orally or you could use a topical clindamycin two percent they're equally effective and therefore the treatment of choice for sporadic first episode really doesn't matter you could use all those those drugs the management of recurrent bacterial vaginosis is a nightmare if anybody on the panel thinks that they have a solution and a cure of recurrent bacterial vaginosis, I'll be happy to give them the Sobel Prize. Um, <laughs> but that's, uh, we don't have ready solutions for recurrent bacterial vaginosis. We are struggling to manage recurrent bacterial vaginosis. So you look for possible, reversible, or preventable factors that I would be, be used to. There's no, I, uh, on a routine basis, I will insist on patients who have, have a recurrent bacterial vaginosis that the male partner use a condom consistently. And unfortunately, condom use is often, people that will acknowledge the, they're using condoms, but not always. This is, a, as, this is an, an issue. We next leave the potential preventable factors, there are not many, and we go then to pharmacological drug-induced approaches to to recurrent bacterial vaginosis. And here I want to mention, there have been no advances for four decades, the availability of two new nitroimidazoles, cyclidazole and tinidazole, have, uh, may offer some more convenience, better tolerance, not, certainly not cheaper uh, use for recurrent bacterial vaginosis, but are definitely not even a half a step forward. So the traditional approach for treatment of recurrent bacterial vaginosis has been a pharmacologic. We can move on to probiotics and other factors a little bit later, but you start off with a pharmacologic basis. So it doesn't help to prolong therapy from a week of metronidazole to two weeks or three weeks. That alone doesn't do the trick. So we, what has emerged over the last 10, 15 years is, has been the approach to use conventional oral therapy with either tinidazole, nitrometazole, any one of them, cyclidazole or oral um, metronidazole, recognizing that duration of therapy is not a major factor. There have been no new drugs. So what emerged around about 10, 12 years ago was the use of conventional therapy, avoiding single dose therapy, using at least one week's therapy with metronidazole orally, which was affordable and available, and to be followed by some form of maintenance therapy. This was a page out of the book of how we approach urinary tract infections. It was aimed at continuing to suppress any bacteria that of the pathogenic family that existed in the vagina without um, <clears throat> per se. And so we saw by, nine, by 2015 that the use of a vaginal uh, maintenance regimen twice weekly took us about half a step forward, not even a full step forward. We could suppress the recurrences, which are very common in certain populations, especially in African women, especially in African-American women. We see an extraordinary amount of recurrent BV. 
So that step of providing an initial induction therapy with metronidazole or one of the nitrometazoles, followed by a maintenance regimen, was a half a step forward, together with condom use and lots of prayer because the cure rates didn't drop dramatically. So now that was sort of phase two. This was now the use of a maintenance regimen. But we were still failing. And then clinical information started to emerge about adding boric acid to the uh, to this. And now we're into the phase of what we call combination therapy. Well, you can't use boric acid by mouth. So boric acid was then studied per vagina. And initially, it was the combination was an oral nitrometazole together with a vaginal uh, <clears throat> form of boric acid. And the publications first started to appear in 2016, 2017, which showed that combination therapy with the benefiting from a synergistic effect of boric acid together with the nitroamidazole did push the cure rates substantially ahead. Not 100%, nowhere near 100%, but a sort of now, now we were starting to see three quarters of a step ahead. And the first regimens were oral metronidazole. And unfortunately, the nitrometazoles are limited into how much you can give by mouth. These drugs, because of their of tolerance, their side effects, you can't give more than four, 500, 700, 50 milligrams of metronidazole or any of these nitrometazoles because the um, the side effects preclude increasing the dose. The dose of uh, these nitrometazoles is very important. There's no question that because of repeated exposures to nitrometazoles over many years, women who have recurrent BV end up with resistant organisms. It took us years, decades to start appreciating the importance of resistance among the bacterial and aerobic pathogens in the causing recurrent disease. You can't therefore, and the first study started appearing now show that dose is important, but you can't increase the dose orally. So you're now obliged to provide, to switch to a vaginal route for your nitrometazole because that does allow you to use higher doses. And in Europe, you've had a thousand milligrams of metronidazole suppositories available for more than a decade from Germany, Wolf and so on. And the South America, Asia, many parts of the world, you've had metronidazole available as a high dose vaginal suppository, 750 milligrams. Mm. Yeah. Which, uh, but, and, and at least the concentrations of these drugs vaginally are substantially higher than what you get with a metronidazole gel. When you put in a metronidazole gel, metrogel, you're putting in 37 milligrams of metronidazole. If you could put in 500 or 700 milligrams, now with this much higher dose, you have the opportunity to, for, for the first time, attack these resistant organisms of, in the vagina. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm... no, I have a question. You know, I have a lot of patients that, yes. you know, boric acid now is commercially available. And I, I like using it's it. It's always of... been commercially available. It's been oh. commercially well, now, available for 200 years. Well, now <laughs> we can get it delivered to our house, you know, in less than 24 hours. Um, but what do you say with some of the patients? You know, I've got some patients that literally want to stay on their boric acid every single night. Um, long term, you know what is what I'm curious how you approach. Okay, so treatment and like, those kinds of patients that I'm don't want to get off the boric acid, or or should we keep them on it, or intermittent, or once a week? Or I'm curious. Okay, lots of questions, lots of answers. Boric acid doesn't cure BV. That's the only message you need to take home tonight. Boric acid has never doesn't cure BV alone. When it works, it works for two reasons. It does have some antibacterial effect. It will reduce the number of bacteria in the vagina, the abundance by one or two logs, and therefore the, the odor may decrease, may decrease. Short term, as long as you're taking the boric acid, the next, the next few days it's back. It works primarily because it is, destroys the biofilm. 
It's not the only anti-biofilm agent in the world. And you're probably going to see an abundance of new anti anti-biofilm agents introduced in the all these anti-biofilm agents are going to be fragile. Okay. Does so that's the first good thing. So it works two ways. It anti-biofilm, and by anti-biofilm, it makes those bacteria, those gonorrhea and plus the other pathogens available. They've taken hostage. They're not, they've taken, they're, 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 they are hiding out in the biofilm. Not hostage, sorry. I've been taken hostage. They are, they're hiding out in the biofilm. They're inaccessible to the antibiotics. And not, not only that, while in the biofilm, gonorrhea and other the organisms undergo genetic changes and that, that perpetuates the resistance development of these organisms in the biofilm. So getting rid of the biofilm with the, with the, with the, with the um, boric acid is a major factor. Plus its antibacterial effect is something, but it is synergistic with metronide as well and all the other nitroamidazoles. And therefore it is much more effective. And therefore, but by, by itself, it will never cure uh, BV. Does it help odor? Yeah, somebody has a gen an odor uh, from BV, it will decrease the odor, which is a great relief for somebody who has chronic and recurrent BV. But in the process, it's also causing resistance. <laughs> you're exposing those bacteria sitting in the biofilm and in the vagina, and now you're going to keep giving them boric acid, which doesn't cure the situation. That may feel a little bit better. You've got to fundamentally aim at curing the entire process, which means I never hand out boric acid on its own. Mm -hmm. It's not totally without a negative. There is a downside, even though it will relieve the odor. Its benefit is when you use it in combination, achieving the synergy. If you're only handing out boric acid every time a woman has intercourse, post coitus her baby happily carrying on, becoming more and more and more resistant under your helpful hands. Okay. You, you were talking about cure. If I can make just a quick uh, question. Cure can be seen as very different things. You ref When you were saying boric acid never cured anyone, which I absolutely agree. But our outcome should be the patient being asymptomatic or a microscopic or microbiological perspective. If she may be asymptomatic, she no longer has the odor, she's still prone to chlamydia, she's still prone to GC, she's True. still prone to preterm labor, she's, she's still prone to all the complications, she's still but prone appear. to HIV, she's still prone to HSV. And most important, the commonest cause of recurring yeast infections recurrent vulvar vaginal candidiasis is BV. Mm -hmm. BV is a pre-candida clinical situation that is the most underappreciated clinical link that exists. You can't, you know, if you have recurrent candida vaginitis in a, in a Caucasian woman who's never had BV, you solve her problem, you don't cure her. We never cure anybody with recurrent candida vaginitis. We control recurrent candida vaginitis. We control it and we control it very well. And we do that with antifungal agents such as maintenance fluconazole and there are many, many regimens. We never cure recurrent candida vaginitis because we never we can't cure genes with an antifungal agent. Not yet. But in a woman who, who is an, an African woman who is more prone to bacterial vaginosis Bacterial vaginosis creates the environment for enhancing candida colonization of the vagina and the pro-inflammatory environment, the pro-inflammatory environment that exists in BV. Remember this, we call bacterial vaginosis vaginosis and not vaginitis yeah. 40 years ago because they don't have vulvitis. They don't have an inflamed red vagina or vulva. So he said, it's an osis. It's an infection of the... Not true. There's plenty of inflammation in BV, but it doesn't express itself with inflammation clinically that you can see. They don't have dyspareunia. They don't have vulvitis. 
but they are symptomatic. They have no question if you do a cytokine profile, they're inflamed. And that inflamed environment absolutely emerge, emerges into the pro-inflammatory environment you need for Canada. So it is many parts of the world when a woman gets an attack of BV, the patient turns around to the practitioner and says, please give me my fluconazole as well, because I'm going to get a yeast infection in two weeks' time. And the doctors do. They give fluconazole, and I approve of it. I think it's good, because you know what? They're going to get a yeast infection in two weeks' time. And if you're into suffering, don't give them the fluconazole. Great. Thank you so much for an in-depth. Ola, your microphone is... Can you hear me now? Much better. Yeah, yes. All right. Yes, sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask Jack, there's a couple of wee things there that struck me. You know, when you were saying about it being um with menstrual cycle, you know, the, the menstruation feeds the um bacterial vaginosis. In relation to recurrence, first of all, do you think there's a role for creating an amenorrheic state to reduce the risk of, of recurrence if it's going to happen during men the menstrual cycle? And just to add to that question, um, because I saw some of the questions coming up, you mentioned the copper coil, but obviously the marina, the chylene, the JDS are more likely to cause amenorrhea, but do you feel they have the same risk of recurrence than the copper coil? So the, the, the theoretically, it should, the risk should be the same for all the IUDs. <clears throat> yeah. But the only data that's emerged, and since we are, a, you know, we are a data-driven population sitting around us, um, we we can only quote the copper because the there's just not the same information about it. You know, okay. uh, as far as altering the, if I see a patient who has recurrent bacterial vaginosis and I look at her history, and she tells me that she has. And I look and she's had multiple episodes and I've experienced her her recurrence rate, seen it in my you know in my office. I I will not start on any maintenance program because we went off on a tangent. I will not start off on a maintenance program for recurrent BV as I would for a recurrent candida patient, but it's a different maintenance program mm -hmm. until I have her removed her IUD. Mm -hmm. Have her remove her IUD. If she's got a fibroid and she's bleeding intermittently, I believe that intermittent bleeding into the vagina due to any gynecologic disorder, what and there must be many, should be fixed. You're not gonna you're not going to cure the BV that is recurrent, that is recurrent, that keeps recurring in someone who is constantly spotting into the vagina or bleeding into the vagina. Whether you should go take take the uh, a giant step towards creating amenorrhea is out of my out of my league. I'm not a gynecologist. I don't mm -hmm. do that, and I think it's very drastic. I attempt to control the recurrent BV with while she's still menstruating. Yeah. So I we're, 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 yeah. Sorry, I was going to say then, even in relation to cervical pathology too, that if there wasn't a, there was a cervical ectropion or something there, then that would be also very valued to treat. Um, because that could cause further recurrence with intermenstrual bleeding and postcoital bleeding as well. Yeah, yeah. So once, so what we established earlier in this discussion is that dose is important. The dose can't be increased dramatically by mouth. A little bit, not much. Therefore, we are aiming at using high dose intravaginal regimens, and we're combining it with boric acid to the best that we can, per vagina only, and then a maintenance regimen is going to be necessary for a woman who keep recurring in spite of it. Remember that the, all, what we're doing is strategizing. We have no new drugs, no new drugs. We strategize. Now in America, one of the first steps we do, which I admitted to, 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 to uh, emphasize, is that clindamycin is more expensive than metronidazole. It's actually more expensive than vaginal metronidazole gel. The insurance, the insurance companies control the country. I think many countries. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So um, it's very, it's remarkable when I see women in the city of Detroit with recurrent bacterial vaginosis. They come in and I go through the list of drugs they've had in the last 10 years. I see no clindamycin. They've never been offered clindamycin. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's just not offered. So the first thing you do is you switch class. You leave the nitromethazoles and you switch to clindamycin. Now, for that woman having a very first episode of candida vagina, a bacterial vaginosis, it doesn't matter whether you use a nitromethazole or clindamycin. But in a woman who's got recurrent disease, who's never had clindamycin, you go to clindamycin as your very first step. Mm -hmm. And it's quite remarkable how many well do well. They not only respond well, but they don't come back with recurrent disease. There are slight differences in, the, in, the, in their uh, microbial spectrum of activity. Clindamycin is a little bit more active against mobilunkus and a few other organisms, and these resistant organisms may still be sensitive to clindamycin or the opposite. So it's harmless. I always give them clindamycin as the first step after I've asked them whether they have recurrent candida vaginitis as well, associated with BV. But then I fortify the clindamycin with the diflucan or fluconazole, one tablet, 150 milligrams, at the start of the week's vaginal therapy as well as on the seventh day of the vaginal therapy. I never start with oral clindamycin, even though in some countries it just may be more accessible. And only because as, I, as an infectious disease doctor, I have a pathologic fear of C. difficile. That's why I never use it. And the risks of C. difficile of the vaginal clindamycin are very, very small. So um, first step I do with recurrent BV, Stop them, hopefully stop them smoking, use of condoms, see what I can do to control me bleeding, switch the class from one to the other to, if they haven't had the clindamycin. If they've had multiple causes of clindamycin, that's nothing to be done about it. I then switch them to a higher dose intravaginal uh, metronidazole if it's available, not, av not much available in America. You can go to a 1.3% instead of a 0.75% gel that's a slight increase. Sometimes works, not a big deal. Otherwise, you send them off to a compounding pharmacy to get 500 or higher milligram tablets of vaginovic. Dose is important. And there's good data to support the role of dose. Not so much duration, but the dose. And if that doesn't work with a higher dose, we then move to combination therapy. And we used to, in the first papers, one gave the nitroamidazole first, followed by the boric acid, but that's sort of stupid, even though I wrote that paper, uh, because one should actually give the boric acid together all the same time, because you want, you want the nitroamidazole to get to those organisms in the bio. So you give it quickly. How long to treat with boric acid together with the nitroamidazole? We don't know. There haven't been enough studies because there are not enough people experimenting and trying. Uh, I usually use lots. One of the things that you learn when you all the people sitting, experts sitting around the table, uh, sitting on the, and talking to the audience today, uh, I think adheres to the what to, to what to the way we function. We become <clears throat> we, we we go very slowly. We don't rush. We avoid short-term courses of therapy. It's a general principle of treating with vaginal infections. Go slowly. Treat longer. Just Thank a, you. Just a, just a general function of my gray hair. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for such a wonderful summary. I'm going to go very quickly to Pedro Baptista, who... Um, He's our current Secretary General, works over in Portugal. And I'm going to be asking questions regarding refractory or recurrent vulvovagin vaginal candidiasis. Um, in particular, I just wonder, how do we go about treating this women? How do we well, know first and foremost is refractory and it's not a relapse or it's not chronic? And then how do we go about treating them? Well, yeah. first thing, and uh, I think our biggest problem starts with diagnosis. Most of the time, the diagnosis is 
just guessed, uh, just empirical. What the symptoms seem typical to the woman, to the clinician, and very often the, the, it does not correspond to candida. The, the symptoms are a very low specificity, so that one can assume it is a, a candidiasis. Um, an uh, acute episode usually is not a problem when things become recurrent. And for that, as I was saying, we need to confirm that diagnosis. And when we very often we get referral for a suspected recurrent candidiasis, some are, some have very different conditions. They were just never properly diagnosed and have been treating with antifungals despite not responding at all to, to it. We are... There's, it's not easy to control associated conditions. It's controversial whether or not to remove an IUD. I think most people, people at the moment, even if recurrent, are not removing immediately the, the IUD. If there is diabetes, for instance, the control should be attempted. A better control of diabetes can help improving the, the recurrence of candidiasis, but with the new drugs, you can actually be doing the, the opposite. They are wonderful tools to control diabetes, but they will increase the risk of, of candidiasis. Once you have your diagnosis, you know it's uh, most likely, which will happen in 90% of the cases, it is a candida albicans. You can start a regimen with uh, fluconazole, in, which was published some years ago by Professor Sobel. It's a, a scheme that works amazingly, at least while they are uh, using it. You start by taking three pills with three days intervals, and then for six months, you take one pill of fluconazole per week. The success rate is over 80%, but unfortunately, once stopped, the relapse rate is quite high. Thank you so much for that. I can see in the webinar chat and also in the question and answer area, there's quite there are quite a few questions on biofilm disruptors and um, you know um, biofilm gels. What are your thoughts about that? For candida, I don't see a role in biofilm di disruptors. Uh, that's a controversial topic, but most uh, authors uh, these day, uh, I think they do not believe that biofilms play an important role in candida but there are some publications supporting the the opposite so for candida that's not a thing i would consider so let me let me just add to that so I, I totally agree so the important thing is when you look at the biofilm associated with bv bacterial vaginosis it's a continuous layer covering the entire surface of the vaginal epithelial surface and it's that ba contains bacteria so it's not a sterile environment, or number one. That kind of biofilm doesn't develop in candida vaginitis. What you get is two different totally things. If you grow yeast in a well in the lab, in a plastic well, or around a catheter, it does form a continuous layer. But you don't see that in candida vaginitis, in the vaginal vagina. Instead of which, you find a kind of a biofilm that forms around the organism, around the yeast and its IV, around the blastospore. You can actually show a biofilm around the organism. It doesn't contain bacteria. It's, it's a totally different entity. And it's whether it's relevant or not, nobody knows. That doesn't stop thousands, dozens of manuscripts coming out here that I, I get to review every month, where people are claiming we've got to do this for it. It is uh, for the biofilm of candida, and the biofilm of candida is causing recurrent candida vaginitis. Nonsense. There's no evidence that it's the case. Not yet. There's no data to to to, to, to show this is the case. Should you specifically treat the biofilm of candida? Well, I agree with Dr. <clears throat> with Pedro again. I do not believe that he's contributing to the thing. But that, that is open still for review, open for research. We're not using antibiofilm agents for, uh, for Canada. That doesn't mean that the, the same drugs, dequilinium, or, um, which is available in many countries in Europe and in Canada now, but not in the United States, 
or boric acids can't be used the, in their own right. These are antifungal drugs, which are very useful. And they're particularly useful. They know better than the azoles for candida albicans, but they may be very useful for, for those species of candida that are not particularly sensitive to azoles, such as candida vibrata, such as candida cruzii, et cetera, then the, these drugs. But that's nothing to do with the biofilm. What I think is some of the most frustrating um, conditions to treat are our patients that have recurrent, you know, candidiasis, or they call in because they have symptoms. Um, you see them once. Um, I, I always have them come back in about six months because a lot of times, as Pedro alluded to, there's more than one thing going on. Maybe they have recurrent candidiasis, but then, you know, they actually have lichen sclerosis or they have um, genital urinary syndrome, my, menopause. A lot of our patients, as everyone on this call that's calling in and sitting here knows, is typically there's more than one thing going on. And I see that, I think, most often with my patients that come in with referral of recurrent candidiasis. I, I'm curious about, you know, others. Thoughts uh, um, so I just want to make a quick response to that, which is, you know, telehealth has been a major advance in, during the pandemic. And in dermatology, you can often you focus beautifully on a rash. You can't manage vaginitis on telehealth. Hmm. We are just not possible. You've got to see the patient. You've got to examine the patient. And the examination of people who have vulvar vaginal symptoms includes both a vulvar exam and a vaginal exam. And you can't leave out the vaginal exam but it requires clinical evaluation and looking for underlying, unrecognized, underappreciated causes that would enhance candida colonization per se, or facilitate the candida immunopathogenesis inflammatory process without colonization. I've got a question. Agree. Oh, sorry. No. Uh, I've got a question here about fluconazole resistance for candidiasis, and I also will throw in, um, what are your thoughts about non-candida albicon infections, particularly um, candida glabrata? Would you treat in the asymptomatic woman, for instance, or would you only treat in symptomatic women? No, in the asymptomatic women, just leave it alone. <laughs> Don't look for it. Yeah, it's along for the ride. Uh, yeah, <laughs> if, if you, for some reason, you get that result, ignore it, stay away from it. If you believe it is the cause of symptoms, obviously you, you need to attempt to treat it. But with the tests we have currently, we cannot, there is no test at the moment that they can distinguish colonization from, from, uh, from actual infection. As Melissa was saying, that woman may have the, her symptoms may be due to a lichen sclerosis that is going unrecognized. And she also happens to be colonized but can, by candida glabrata or any other species. Anyway, if symptomatic, my personal approach is boric acid. I don't see any benefit in other medical approaches. We don't have yet available the, the new drugs, namely Rexafunger. We don't have it uh, yet available in Europe. So my approach is still um, boric acid. What are your thoughts about um, vaccinations? It's a hope for it's a hope for the future. Some promising results, not the amazing results we would like to see, as we have in other vaccines. But uh, things seem to be moving. Some efficacy, uh, mostly for women uh, under the age of, of forty, in which uh, it has been shown uh, some result. But we are still far from having a commercially available uh, vaccine, uh, as far as I know. Okay. I will move on. Sorry. Sorry, I was going to ask um to Lou, sorry for interrupting. Um I I completely agree with all of the speakers, uh, with Melissa and Pedro about saying about that it could be other comorbidities. And certainly um I see a large number of women with lichen sclerosis, and for maybe two or three years they thought that they've had candida and they've never maybe been examined properly or they've used hydrocortisone um in the Cotriamazole in Ireland, we have the Caniston HC, which has is a combination 
Um, and a lot of women think then they've got thrush, because, but it's actually the hydrocortisone element of the cream that's actually worked for them in relation yeah. to the lichen sclerosis. And um, so first of all, even in relation to this vulvar awareness day, I think it's fantastic that we're actually talking about these things, you know, to clinicians and to the public to educate women that, you know, their vulva itch is not always <laughs> um, candida. But second of all, then, uh, Pedro, in relation to treatment of recurrence and difficult cases, um, you know, what Jack had said, even about bacterial vaginosis in relation to the menstrual cycle, you know, sometimes I would try to, and it is, it is using guidelines, but also trying to individualize the patient because some women do really feel their menstrual cycle makes it so much worse. And um, so, you know, sometimes it is a case of cyclically using antifungal agents um, so I just wanted your thoughts on that and also to also remember the pre-pubertal, the children that can present with candida, but then because they have a low estrogen state, they also kind of like sclerosis. So it's also important from a, you know, a young child's perspective um, with these issues, which can be really difficult, particularly at night with their sleep and even passing urine. And then, of course, hygiene for young children as well. Um, so it's just really in relation to treating children and then cyclical treatment in relation to the menstrual cycle. Well, in children, I think the first idea we need to, to pass is that it's actually quite rare to find uh, candidiasis in uh, healthy children. You don't see it very, very often. I, I would say that until otherwise proven, something else is explaining the, the symptoms, even if as we talk of vaginitis, the vaginitis in children most often are bacterial and most of the time they don't need the treatment unless they it's it's causing any disturbance otherwise most of the case they will just disappear by, by themselves the candida symptoms indeed tend to be cyclical uh, worsening just before the menses and having uh, a significant improvement uh, as the ph uh, increases during during the menses which actually also matches the the pattern that we see in cytolytic vaginosis so obviously many of these uh, and I, I know how controversial the topic of cytolytic vaginosis is but i, I assume i'm a believer um, a lot of the patients who are referred as uh, having a, a suspicion for a recurrent candidates, very often you will find the cytotic pattern and, and you will need to, to address it. I know it's very common that uh, trying to treat candida using uh, courses of fluconazole around the mens is just before, or just after I've seen everything tried. Um, uh, my in my personal experience, I prefer to do it weekly. I, I I don't see good results. I don't use the scheme. I see referrals. Obviously, it's biased. If they were referral referred, is because they were not having a, a good uh, positive uh, response. I tend to avoid it. I think we we need to be aggressive when treating recurrent uh, candidiasis. This is obviously just a personal opinion especially in young women, women in their 20s, as soon as they start having frequent uh, candidiasis, I treat them aggressively. I, I think it may make a difference in the future. I obviously have no data to support that, but that's my feeling. You know, when, when otherwise healthy women who do yeah. not have an underlying cause, whether it is lichen sclerosis or eczemas or any, anything else, they have what we call primary or idiopathic recurrent candida vaginitis. And that's most of the time, well over 90%, it's going to be candida albicans. And almost always it's going to be a, an azole sensitive. Who can use maintenance regimens vaginally, which is a pain in the neck to most people, or you could use once weekly fluconazole. And there are variations around around that some people use a smaller dose twice a week, mm -hmm. some people like to use it premenstrually and so on. But a once week, all these regimens, and certainly a once weekly regimen of fluconazole, once a week, as long as they're taking the fluconazole once a week, you can say two things. Their ability to control symptoms and give them a normal, normal life is well over 90%, well over 90%. And this has stood the test of time 
for two or three decades. The risk of recurrence of, uh, sorry, of uh, resistance, resistance developing in the C. albicans in women who have idiopathic or primary recurrent candida vaginitis is less than two or three percent. It's rare. It is not rare. Resistance, however, in C. albicans is not rare in women who have bacterial vaginosis plus candida. Mm -hmm. You, when we look at all our resistance C. albicans, and I have this bank of resistance C. albicans resistance, 70 or 80 percent of the patients who had C. albicans resistance to diflucan, and fluconazole, or any of the azoles have got recurrent bacterial vaginosis. We have you a lot of questions. Control, yeah, you can't control recurrent candida vaginosis. The recurrent candida vaginitis, if you have recurrent bacterial vaginosis. Yeah. Yeah. Cure the bacterial vaginosis, control the bacterial vaginosis, you'll control the candida. And we have, especially uh, if they've got resistant strains. I was thinking there's a, a lot of questions. There's one I find particularly interesting, which is anybody using it, itroconazole. I don't use it. I think the, the profile is similar to that of, of fluconazole. Don't feel it adds much. So, Just more toxic. Yeah. We use itraconazole, you're sort of obliged to get liver function tests every few months. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'll pick a very quick question here. I think this is a lady who works in pediatric gynecology. And she said here, would you comment on vaginal discharge in girls? Um, a whole lot of time, pediatricians assume and treat for gardnerella. You know, what about um, BV, incidence of BV in pre-puberty? There's no such thing. Thank you. Very succinct, <laughs> straight to the point. <laughs> <laughs> Great. The other question I think I'll be trying to Melissa, who's joined us from Texas, is, oh God, where are we now? Yeah. Yeah, what are your thoughts about excluding discriminative inflammatory vaginitis in women presenting with atrophic vaginitis of menopause? What are your thoughts? So as a dermatologist, a lot of times by the time patients get to me with, you know, they come in, they have copious discharge, filling up two or three pads multiple times a day. Um, when I do my wet prep, I mean, it's floridly full with white white cells and parabasal cells. They come in, they've been, you know, uh, all the infectious diseases have been checked off. Um, and so in that, in my mind, you know, uh, that patient has DIV. I think what's hard about, you know, having uh, lots of white cells and parabasal cells is it's not necessarily specific, right? We can see that in DIV, you can see that in pemphigus. Um, you can also see it in atrophic vaginitis. And so I look for my clinical exam, you know, in the right patient setting, a lot of the patients um, with the atrophic vaginitis or genitourinary syndrome or menopause, you know, they're obviously in their 60s, 70s, sometimes older. Um, I think that perimenopausal period is very interesting to me, and I, I do hope that we study that more in the future, you know, the five years before um, menses completely stop, and then, you know, the five years after, and there's just a lot of uh, symptoms patients have that I'd, I'd love to explore more. Um, but to me, the patients with DIV, again, they come in with that copious uh, discharge, you know, filling up multiple, multiple pads several times a day. And, and I, I love the regimen that, um, Dr. Sobel has, you know, uh, created with this. I mean, I treat those patients with, um, hydrocortisone and clindamycin vaginally. Uh, you know, I, I do have a lot of patients that come in on one, uh, compounded hydrocortisone or, uh, clindamycin. Um, I don't know if there's studies right now to show that the combination is better than either two of those treatments alone. Uh, in my experience, I like the combination of the clindamycin and the hydrocortisone. And then for a lot of my patients, you know, most of them will recur when you stop the treatment um, for DIV. And so I taper them down. Um, and most of my patients, I can get them on uh, once weekly uh, uh, treatment. Typically it's either clindamycin or hydrocortisone. And if they're postmenopausal, I will add an estrogen also. Um, and so I keep them on their vaginal estrogen um, to kind of regulate 
um, the the pH of of their vagina. But I'm curious, you know, for for others on the the talk, um, that's something I'm looking at right now. We're doing a, a systematic review, looking at all the treatments for DIV. You know, is the combination better than either alone? Um, but curious for others out there, you know, what your treatment of choice is, maybe for D, for DIV. Thank you very much. The other question that also comes to mind oftentimes is um, the role of estrogen or estrogen in um, atrophic vaginitis and also the likelihood of women developing candidiasis, you know, when they have on both, I think, oral and vaginal um, estrogen preparations. What would you advise? So I was always taught that when you start a postmenopausal woman, on estrogen, they and and specifically also with topical steroids, they can be a slightly higher risk for getting candidiasis in that beginning, uh, you know, two to four four week period. And so, if I'm starting someone on, uh, hopefully this isn't too controversial out there, but if I'm starting someone on vaginal estrogen and topical steroids once or twice a day, um, I will give them oral fluconazole just because that risk of developing candidiasis is higher. But in most of my women uh, that come in and I'm starting on, on vaginal estrogen, I do not give them oral fluconazole. Uh, I was uh, told, and one of my colleagues also said that the, the best probiotic uh, is vaginal estrogen when we're talking about probiotics there and, and getting the pH of our vagina down. Um, so I don't routinely give uh, oral uh, antifungals when I'm just starting uh, patients on uh, regular vaginal estrogen. The other thing is a dermatologist, I found that most of my women mm -hmm. that come in with symptoms of genital urinary syndrome and menopause, you know, they're, mm -hmm. some of them are seventies and in, in their eighties. I don't routinely start the nightly estrogen for two weeks and then go to maintenance. I actually just start them on maintenance, um, two to three times a week, um, depending, you know, on how their, their discussions go. So I found that I had a couple of patients at the breast tenderness and some of them actually had spotting when they went on the daily treatment mm -hmm. with, with vaginal estrogen. So now I, I really just do the maintenance um, when I see patients. You are a natural incrementalist. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to add to that, Melissa, I think that vaginal estrogen is a treatment for so many things because so many women don't realize, and as you say, that perimenopausal group, that would be a big group of patients that I would see, say, for example, for perimenopausal bleeding, menstrual disorders, and so many of them, when you examine them and you do the hysteroscopy, they do have atrophic vaginitis. They don't even realize they had it, have it. They could have like a, a mild, even like a simplex picture, starting with some fissures on the posterior fourchette. And they don't actually realize that their vulva itch is to do particularly with the low estrogen state, to do with the lichen simplex or sclerosis. And also no one or very few women actually make the connect with the urogenital symptoms like cystitis, recurrent urinary tract infections that happens with the, the narrowing of the urethra with incomplete bladder emptying, which is all associated with the atrophy of the vagina and the vulva and the urethra. So, you know, local estrogen in itself is, a, you know, a, largely helps all of those symptoms. And, you know, the whole genital urinary area is it's greatly improved. And the other thing just to say is there's so few women out there that can't take vaginal estrogen because breast cancer patients, I mean, I was at the International Menopause Society joint meeting with the Irish Menopause Society on Saturday and I did get a plug for this uh, webinar but you know that there was discussions with oncology as well that there's there's no breast cancer patient that can't take vaginal estrogen and there's you know other than that even with vaginal cancers and that sort of thing vaginal estrogen can be used so there was a study I think in Denmark that had thought that there was a increased risk of using vaginal estrogen with women who were on aromatase yeah. inhibitors but now that has actually been um, challenged and it's thought that because the dose is so small even in a maintenance dose so that's something to remember because there's so many breast cancer patients that are really suffering with vaginal problems because of the lack of estrogen so 
Now, obviously, if you don't feel comfortable prescribing it, it is important to seek specialist advice and whether they, you know, a, a GP refers patients to a dermatologist or a gynecologist and liaise with oncology and the, and the breast service. But certainly that is something to remember and how important vaginal estrogen can be in dealing with all of these issues. Yeah, it's so important. And I think what's amazing still is patients come in, they have their list of symptoms, you know, urinary frequency, increased UTIs, you know, and you tell them, I think this one thing is going to hit a lot of them and they just don't believe you. And then they come back and they're so thankful and happy that with one medicine, they've traded in four, you know, they don't have to take their antibiotics for the recurrent UTIs anymore. Uh, I I'll also say that, you know, I recently had a patient and I, I do, um, give out both handouts and articles for my patients. I think they really love looking at that, uh, when, when they leave your office, but I had a patient that she'd been getting, men, um, mammograms, you know, yearly, she, I think she was in her early sixties. I started her on, um, low dose vaginal, um, estrogen, this, the, the 10 MCGs three times a week. Um, she had her mammogram two months later and she had early breast cancer. And I told her, you know, I, I don't think that the two months of that low dose vaginal estrogen may have caused that breast cancer. Maybe it was there all along and would have developed. Um, but you know, those are those discussions that I, I think are important to, to have with patients. And I'm glad we found it. I'm sorry that she had that. Um, and, I, but I do think that that's more on the rare case. I mean, I think that's one patient, but again, I think the two months that she was on that vaginal estrogen, I don't necessarily think it was that one that, that pushed it forward. Um, and I think a large majority, you know, uh, uh, you know, women are living so long these days, right. They're diagnosed maybe in their forties with breast cancer. And then, you know, and there, are we going to say that if you take away vaginal estrogen for the next 50 years, um, they can enjoy their lives. So I, I 100% echo that. And I'm so glad that that came up at the meeting, um, uh, just the importance of uh, local vaginal estrogen for our, for our patients. And uh, the problem with breast cancer, it's the fact that it is very common. I use that example a lot in women with lichen sclerosis. They go over the internet and they find 5% uh, lifelong risk, risk, which I believe it's much less than that. But And you get these women absolutely scared in your office. It, I, I usually do this exercise for being a woman, probably living over the age of 80, the likelihood that you will have one day a breast cancer is 10%. Mm -hmm. Still, your risk of over cancer worst case scenario is five percent so you have twice the risk of having a breast cancer and i think we can use the same strategy with with estrogens it is likely to happen and not necessarily do the, the estrogens i usually start them on, on do two, for two weeks i do use it daily contrary to to melissa I, I don't think I have a problem with patients stopping because of the symptoms, as long as you explain that it is predictable that she will have burning, that most likely is just a pH dropping, that it's a good sign that she will reach full results in eight weeks. As long as you explain exactly what she can expect to happen, I think it works. Quite, kind of the women with candidiasis during pregnancy in which you have a hard time controlling them, they know that they, they will have nine terrible months, then they, as long as they are breastfeeding, they will be doing better, but they accept it much better than out of pregnancy. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I will say uh, uh, one more question, the big elephant in the room. What are your thoughts about vaginal lasers? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, there was a wonderful JAMA study that came out, uh, I think about a year ago, showing that compared to placebo, there was no benefit for genitourinary syndrome of menopause. It was a very, very well done study um, in, in main JAMA. But for each good study, we have a hundred uh, terrible studies without a control group <laughs> with short term follow up uh, with uh, subjective outcomes, uh, no comparison group. Mm -hmm. But those hundreds of papers that are being published, they are presented to us uh, as evidence. The very good papers from uh, Belgium, from the Jan de Prest group, the JAMA paper, they are just ignored. It even led to um, to the editorial, which was, I think, time to stop. Nothing happened. Yeah. Well, I think the big thing is outcomes, right? And I think with all of us here, I know that um, Rosalind Simpson's group and multiple others are looking at outcomes, not only for lichen sclerosis, but for lots of these conditions we see. But I think, it, you know, pushing things forward, really honing in on the, the clinical outcomes 
for our disease, but also for our patients um, and just what those treatment outcomes are. I've seen advertising. I'm sorry, this is a, that's one thing I can't avoid, but I've seen advertising laser to treat candida and to improve the microbiome. Yeah, I think I think we have to be so careful because I actually myself last year was very close to purchasing a laser and it was just the week that JAMA study came out. So luckily I hadn't actually, you know, proceeded with it. Look, maybe in the future there will be evidence, but I think patients, you know, they're looking for a quick fix. They're looking for, you know, they, let's talk about even benefits of urinary incontinence. But when you actually really think logically about what it does, then you realize, you know, and, and even prolapse very far fetched, <laughs> you know, to think that it will really, I mean, I was so hopeful thinking about so many patients that would feel more comfortable maybe using a laser than using local estrogen because of having breast cancer and all of that. But I think, you know, patients have to be so careful because, you know, it is like false advertisement and, you know, they're looking for something that will fix it. But I really don't think the evidence is there that they're going to, you know, get a good outcome. Certainly. Certainly. I have to say a very big thank you. As with all good things, there must be an end. And I, I'm mindful we're running over a little bit. So I'd like to express my immense gratitude to all the panel members. I'm sorry I couldn't quite introduce you completely. We just got carried away with all the interesting debate going on. So Melissa from Texas, Ola from Ireland, Jack from Michigan, Federica from Torino, and Jill from... Oh, I've got to remember now. <laughs> Jill, help me, please help me, help me, help me. Sorry, from Maryland. From Maryland, thank you. I completely apologize. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. And I also have to thank um, members of the audience who have logged in for this session. Your questions have been very um, provoking, very interactive, I hope that we've answered most of your questions. I believe this will be a recording available on YouTube. So it will be useful, you know, to, to go back and just have a listen in and um, possibly get answers just in case you had missed it at any point in time. Um, thank you so much, panel members. Despite the short notice, personal busy schedules, you came on board. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I would love to say at this point in time, there's a useful resource. I'll bring the book up. So I know it's been advertised previously. <laughs> it's a very beautiful book, ISSVD publication in March, 2023. And it's on diagnosis, recommendations for diagnosis and treatment of vaginitis. It's available free. You can download it free from the ISSVD website. It has to be a must on your shelf for anybody intentional about vulva vaginitis. And thank you, Belisa, for the floating vulva. <laughs> and I'm sure you can see in my background, different pictures of vulvas. Um, I have to say thank you to my team. They simply did this. I was too busy doing other things and being on call and they've done this. So please, Let's all carry on um, creating the awareness. We'll be back. We will we will come back, I believe, in another 17 minutes for the patient court. So for patients and, um, car um, and their car carers, and we're hoping to have a quick um, run through as to normal and abnormal vaginal discharge, vaginitis, what they can do in the comfort of their homes before they get to the clinician's desk and also what they can do to prevent recurrence um, going forward. Well, thank you, thank you so much for your time and hope to see you all in Slovenia next year um, for a very interesting deliberation. Thank you. Any last words from everyone, any one of us? So wonderful. Good afternoon. Well, good day, actually, because it's afternoon over here, but it's morning over in the United States. So wonderful. Thank you so much for coming back to join us again for the second session of this Volvo Awareness Day set of webinars. Um, thank you.
to the audience and also thank you very much to my panel. I will make a quick round of introductions because I missed that previously. So we already know Pedro Baptista, who is our current Secretary General of the ISSVD and also my co-organizer for this webinar set of sessions. In addition, we have Ola Conlon, who's from Northern from Ireland, um, based, practice based in Sligo and Galway, uh, with special interest in ambulatory gynecology, colposcopy, vulvar disease, and psychosexual medicine. Then we all have Federica Belvoacqua, who is my co-chairperson, wonderful help she's been and currently and continues to be from Italy, um, Turing to be exact. And we've got Jill. Jill has come from Maryland. Jill, I got it right now, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> forgive me, forgive me. Um, Jill's interest is in um, dermatopathology being the consultant, actually, hold on. She's an associate professor of dermatology over in Maryland. And Melissa, thank you so much for coming to join us again. And uh, great. I think we better get started because I'm very mindful of you know time constraints. So this session really is targeted at patients and their carers, really. And we are not going to really talk about the in-depth, you know, management per, per se. What we will be looking at really is just having a conversation. So a woman walks through the door and she's worried about a vaginal discharge, whether rightly or wrongly so. How do we go about reassuring them? I will make a quick head start first because I've had situations where I've had young girls walk through the door you know, sometimes with their mothers in tow and complain about this vaginal loss or this vaginal discharge. And oftentimes you would then examine them. Oh, before I go any further, they may be a few years off Medicaid. So you could argue that their cycles are yet to settle, you know, into a regular pattern. And oftentimes some of those ladies or some of those girls are going through an immense amount of pressure or stress because they're having to do their end of year exams or their GCSEs as we would like to call it here in England. So inherent stress, inherent anxiety, and then she notices this few changes in her body and she's thinking what in the world is going on. And oftentimes it's so reassuring to be able to say to her after a quick examination that, oh, there's nothing to worry at all about. You know, everything looks okay. The vulva, I also use an opportunity to also um, reassure them regarding how normal looking their vulvas are. Hopefully nipping in the bird, any concerns about having vulva surgeries, given the, you know, interesting effects we get from social media and how young people in particular are quite pressurized, you know, to have a certain type of vulva um, architecture. And then having that conversation, you know, to um, talk about the underlying, uh, should I say, effects of estrogen and how their vulva discharge will change in the cycle. For those who have regular cycles, I normally would say, you know, every two weeks, you should expect a bit of a change. This is just a sign that potentially you might be ovulating, you know, so do not find it abnormal. Do not think that sticky goo, like one of my patients once said to me, she said, oh, it's awful. It's sticky. It's gooey. And all I could do was just smile politely and think, darling, you better be happy. That's what tells you it was probably quite productive, you know, and, you know, offer that reassurance and say, look, the sticky goo is not anything disgusting. Um, and this are our patient's words, to be exact, you know, but it's actually very normal for you. And, you know, the other um, end of the stick with the physiological discharge cases I've had is maybe those who have had a huge um, weight change. So either those who've put on huge amounts of weight or they've lost huge amounts of weight, tying down with the estrogen production. And by default, you know, their microbiota, as we discussed earlier on, you know, gets a bit slightly deranged. The ones I tend to be a bit more cautious with are those who I worry about 
particularly given the history of smoking, you know, multiple sexual partners, then I get really worried about those ones because then, of course, like we heard earlier, Ron, there's that risk of DV. And therefore, I would not want to falsely reassure them, but I would, would certainly want to um, counsel them with regards to optimizing, you know, their, their choices. So healthy living, exercise within reason, you know, um, healthy diets, cutting down on smoking, trying to cut down on stress as well, because we know stress certainly has an impact of vaginal discharge through the cortisol pathway. So a quick whistle talk tour. So I'll go very quickly to Federica. What are your thoughts and what, how, what would you offer a lady walking through the door with vulvar vaginal candidiasis, you know, worries, concerns, I mean, she may not even be yet to make, she's still yet to be diagnosed in some cases, but what would you say? Thank I'll you. I'll say to her that she hasn't to worry about it because uh, it is estimated that um, almost 50% of women has once in a lifetime with a vaginal candidiasis. And uh, I'll ask her about uh, trying to obtain her history, her symptoms and... Uh, if she has uh, this, the typical thick white discharge, the cheesy discharge, if she has itching, irritation, burning, uh, uh, if it vaginal, vulvar, or both. And uh, if it's not, if I don't think it's a complicated candidiasis and it's the first time she has it, uh, I do not have to strictly go to the culture so I can uh, try to start a treatment after an examination of the patient uh, and I'll try to individualize it uh, based on uh, the drug av availability, tolerability, price and patient preference but uh, if only if it's symptomatic because if it's asymptomatic uh, it doesn't require uh, any sort of treatment what i would like to highlight that uh, uh, it's very important uh, that the patient ask to her doctor a uh, healthcare professional of trust uh, to uh, undergo to an examination because uh, uh, it's very very um, uh, often that patients undergo to misdiagnosis because uh, maybe a friend will tell, oh, it, it is uh, vulvovaginal candidiasis, take this medication and try to see if it works. Uh, it's uh, a wrong uh, behavior. It's important to get examined uh, by a doctor. Uh, and uh, to start the therapy, if uh, it's an uncomplicated vulvovaginal candidiasis, with symptoms uh, and uh, the um, target therapy is uh, the yeah, azole uh, and there is topical one, ointments, uh, suppositories, so it, you can go through it uh, and try it uh, and uh, it will resolve up to 80-85% of cases, so it's a very good percentage. What can we do uh, after the treatment to reduce the risk that these will show up again. Uh, there are some hints. Uh, we can start on good personal hygiene uh, and avoiding uh, irritating products. Uh, to wear cotton underwear that allows uh, the skin to breathe uh, and uh, won't trap uh, moisture in the vulvar area. Uh, to limit the antibiotic use and to take antibiotics only after medical prescription prescription, limit sugar and carbohydrate intake because uh, candida like uh, sugars in your diet. Uh, of course, practicing safe sex uh, because uh, it's, the, it's very, very important uh, to prevent the transmission of the fungus from one partner to another and try to maintaining an healthy immune system and an healthy lifestyle that is the best way to, to prevent uh, another infection. And to remember that everyone is different and that what, what, what works with 
for one person may not work for another. So if you have frequent issues with vulvovaginal candidiasis, it's very, very important to discuss it with your doctor to identify the cause, undergo to a culture, identify, identify the yeast and uh, treat it properly. Rick, I, I would add that all these measures can be helpful, but are often very disappointing because we change all that. And in most women with recurrent candidiasis, it's unlikely to, to change. Uh, the restriction in carbohydrates uh, it has a huge effect in a very few little set of patients, probably 10% of those patients actually improve and improve significantly when they stop consuming sugar. So I think we should absolutely agree with all that you've said, but we must keep the expectation not too high. And for instance, if you are telling a woman that is suffering from a terrible candidiasis, and the life of these women can be absolutely terrible, and we are just adding more and more restrictions. So I think we must be careful. Usually I say try it for one month or two months. If nothing happened, just stop it. Of course, thank you. Well done. Thank you so much for that. I will go very, very quickly to Ola. Thank um, you. <laughs> uh, and my question really will be on um, the woman with atrophic vaginitis. I mean, we, Melissa said quite a bit earlier on, but I think my focus really is before she gets to the physician, before she gets that vaginal estrogen, what other things can we be, you know, discussing with her with regards management of atrophic vaginitis or vulvovaginitis? You mean, well, as we said in previous discussion, um, you know, local estrogen is the key. Obviously, we want to make sure that that it is just the atrophic vaginitis that's causing her the symptoms that she doesn't have an underlying infection or recurrent candida and also whether she correlates the symptoms with um you know whether there's another skin condition whether there is lichen sclerosis there because a lot of women don't realize that um a lot of the symptoms are the same for lots of these conditions where they have the recurrent candida or thrush as they call it um, and the itch and the vulval itch and whether it wakens them at night and um, also in the menopause for example some women can have a wee bit of bleeding and that can is can be caused by the atrophy the thinning of the tissue and um, as well as the recurrent urinary tract infections but one of the keys as well to making that diagnosis for women and how they would know if their body has changed in the menopause particularly in relation to the vagina and the vulva is the appearance of the vulva, vulva can change because the vagina can get very narrow. Intercourse a lot of the time is very sore or impossible. And sometimes even the labia on the outside can fuse. And the, even at the top of the vagina around the clitoris can be very, can stick together. So the actual opening of the vagina is much smaller. So that can also be a sign for women that there's something changing down there in relation to the menopause. So um, in relation to what you can do, um, we, we discourage use of anything perfumed or any creams or whatever, but I do learn a lot from my patients and, you know, some of the more benign barrier methods for our barrier creams, for example, um, there are lots of vaginal lubrications that you can just buy across the counter. There's one brand that's called in the UK and Ireland that's called Yes, Yes, Yes. Oh, .org. and I think it's very valuable to use oil-based lubrication even as opposed to water-based because I think the oil-based lubrication can give some moisture as well um, and even things like about you know if they're in the swimming pool they might need to use a wee bit of barrier even in the likes of very you know minimal barrier creams and it's also important to look for other medical problems because a lot of women maybe with thyroid issues which is much more common in the in women over the age of 50 to have an underactive thyroid they can also have problems in relation to the skin condition called lichen sclerosis so um it's important to make sure that they have don't have an underactive thyroid and other conditions like if they have arthritis or other autoimmune things or psoriasis you can get psoriasis in the vulva too so it's looking at the whole woman as opposed to just the vulva, but the most important part of it is examining the vulva. So for women, just, I think, I think a lot of patients, you know, they need to be listened to 
And as I say to them, it's like putting the jigsaw puzzle together. The local estrogen is a big part of that jigsaw puzzle, but it's very important to know what their symptoms are but also then they need to be seen by their GP or nurse specialist or gynecologist, dermatologist to know what's going on. But we do learn an awful lot from our patients. And some women, for example, would say that they do get good relief with organic coconut oil or even some patients. There's, there is a, um, uh, a trend here that we go to seaweed baths. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really sure if it's the kelp in the seaweed, which can also be to do with the iodine, to do with your thyroid, or it's just the, the oiliness of the seaweed that some patients would say they get relief with going for a seaweed bath and that sort of thing. But um, which, you know, everybody's different, but we do learn so much from our patients and how they experience the different conditions. But certainly there are things that you can do. But just to reiterate as well, that there's so few patients that can't actually use local estrogen. Even if you have breast cancer and are in treatment for breast cancer, this can cause real problems with the vagina, with the narrowing, the dryness. And those patients certainly can still consider using a wee bit of local estrogen into the vagina. Just a couple of um, comments to echo all of those wonderful things. One is often in my patients, um, people over clean. And so I think a lot of times we're taught that because it itches or you have pain, that it must be dirty. My vulva, my vagina must be dirty. So I consider the vagina most often a self-cleaning oven. Um, so you don't have to really aggressively rub and scrub and get in there. Um, I think that rinsing with water is fine. Um, the, the, the other thing I tell my patients is that with time, this sags, these sag, and everything below gets tucked up. So Ouch. over time, your inside <laughs> lips do drink a little. And that can be hard for both patients and clinicians when we're trying to distinguish some of these vulvar conditions from just normal change. But I think looking at your vulva and your vagina is super important, but don't let it drive your life, right? So, I mean, our, our goal is for um, us to use these things um, like we want to, but for not for them to kind of... Uh, just completely take over everything. So if you start having symptoms, I think going to your doctor sooner rather than later, instead of ping-ponging back and forth, you know, uh, trying different local things. Um, so that would be one of my biggest um, plugs here uh, is just to, you know, if you have symptoms, uh, look and then go talk to your doctor. So I agree with uh, Melissa and Orla. I find that a lot of patients, though, are using the things that more are more irritating over the counter. So the things that we would actually not, that can actually make the problems worse. So you really want to look into something that's oil-based, no fragrances, no menthol. In the U.S., a lot of people use Vagisil, which a lot of people have secondary problems from. Um, so simple oils. And, you know, I know that right now we all like organic stuff, but you can have a contact dermatitis to coconut oil. You can be allergic to it. So just because it's organic doesn't mean it's going to always help your problems. So we have to keep that in mind that organic things can be quite irritating and allergenic, too. And estrogen is organic and natural. That's why we love it. <laughs> but you can't get, yeah, but people are so resistant, unfortunately. Yeah. What are your thoughts about hyaluronic acid? Because that seems to be the new thing now, in addition to, I won't talk about the lasers. We've talked enough about the lasers, so I won't go there. But what about hyaluronic acid? You mean use it uh, yeah. injected so oh. mucosal or vaginal use? Uh, for the vaginitis side of things, for the atrophic I, side I of think things. It's, uh, as a moisturizer, is probably one of the best options you have as it's able to retain a huge amount of, of water. Obviously, it will not reverse atrophy, but mm -hmm. can help the woman feel more comfortable and maybe overcome the, the fear and the pain uh, with sex. Concerning now, there's a new trend to inject hyaluronic acid uh, under the mucosa, uh, all the, the vulva region. That I don't think we have any evidence uh, to to recommend that at the moment. It's used as ovules or pills or whatever locally. I think it's an interesting option for women who, who do not want to use estrogens or cannot use other options as a breastron or a spamifen. I think it's, it's an interesting option. Thank you. 
Thank you. And then very quickly moving on, I'm going to, actually, before we move on, I've just seen a very interesting question from Lauren. And she says here that she has a colleague who treats everyone with vaginal discharge with flagell followed by diflocan. Um, I've been trying to change this culture, but find it very hard. When patients report that they want diflocan for the yeast infection that they will get after flagell, any words of wisdom? Well, if you do that, uh, the the fact is that probably in uh, two weeks, most of the patients will be asymptomatic. Even if you do nothing, most patients will be asymptomatic okay. in, in two weeks. I tend to make fun of that by saying if there, if there were no gynecologists, if there were no physicians, all women would be itching because everyone gets a candida. So they, and actually things do go away. If you go by a probabilistic approach if you start you treating for uh, trichomonas <laughs> and uh, NBV, <laughs> you are likely to get more than half a percent of the cases of vaginitis if that woman did not ever if she was colonized and then you give her an antifungal she will probably will improve but this obviously does not make sense to this approach i think that's something you can do if you are in the end of the world and you have absolute absolutely no way to do a proper diagnosis and one thing i think that's kind of a sin you can commit sometimes but not something you can commit uh, every every uh, other month or uh, two or three times a month if the symptoms start and i'm obviously not recommending that this is a correct approach i don't recommend it i don't think it makes sense i think it's part of our job to do the proper diagnosis and give the correct treatment uh, even if used locally, uh, metronidazole is still antibiotic, so we should restrict its use to when it is really needed. But that would be my point of view. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, I think um, as a dermatologist and other dermatologists, we see these women that are trapped in that cycle where they've been treated for four years for recurrent candida and they actually have lichen planus or they have lichen sclerosis and a lot of architecture, a lot of unreversible sequela can happen in that cycle. So it's really important um, um, to see them, especially if if you do do this and um, to make sure that you that the treatment's appropriate and you're treating everything that's going on. And the medium that patients are examined, I've seen, and this is unfortunately a true story, a woman in her 70s was being treating for clotrimazole. And one night her nephew took her to the emergency room. She had a vulvar cancer the size of my fist. Yeah. And she died in two weeks. Yeah, I think as you said, the, the, the history is important, but the examination is really yes. important. And it's not yes. just vulval, it's vaginal as well. And just as uh, to put my colposcopy head on to just to reinforce to people to women that they also need to make sure that they're up to date with their cervical screening, their cervical smears as well. Certainly, certainly, certainly. Probably in these, if people are un unfortunate, and we had this discussion last week, uh, about the use or the non-use of the microscopy. And I obviously believe everyone who is treating these patients should be using a microscope. We know it is not happening and it's unlikely to, to happen. So probably the next step will be the use of molecular tests, PCR tests, probably will it will create huge new problems. It will multiply the problems we had before when using cultures. It will multiply it significantly. But still, I think it's a better approach than just trying to guess by the symptoms or by the color or the consistency of the discharge. You're quite right about that, um, Pedro, because I remember somebody made a comment in the chat box earlier on about um, using the molecular test leading to a possible overdiagnosis, you know, and then what do we do with that new problem? But yeah, yeah, you're right. It, you're right. it still won't be worse than what is happening currently. <laughs> it will happen, but it's not as bad as what is happening these days. So hopefully we'll miss less patients. Okay. Jill, I was going to ask, um, with from the inflammatory point of view, um, 
what are your thoughts about, you know, associations with dermatosis and other, you know, skin conditions, you know, inflammatory vulvar vaginitis? Well, some of them play a key role in vaginitis. Like, you know, the thing we think about the most, of course, is erosive lichen planus. And you pretty much always have to treat the uh, vagina um, and remember to do that. So you have to make sure the patient doesn't have something else going on. It can, uh, you know, perhaps they do have uh, vulvar atrophy because they're postmenopausal, but they may also have lichen planus. They may have uh, lichen sclerosis with an overlap with lichen planus. So we really need to think about those things too, besides just the inflammation um, from uh, postmenop from lack of estrogen or disease or sexually transmitted disease. So we want to keep that in mind. And actually, clinical exam of looking at the mouth, looking at other areas of the body can give us the diagnostic clues. I just recently had a woman with um, erosive lichen planus and she had a beautiful mouth exam, um, which was just diagnostic. So, you know, all thoughts of biopsying the vulva area just were not necessary because her mouth was so great for lichen planus. I think that's one hard thing that's hard about when patients come to a specialty clinic too, because it's often more than just one thing going on as, mm -hmm. as Jill mentioned. And so unless we attack and treat each one of those things, we won't get to goal. Uh, and I think a lot of us probably do get referral virus. Maybe there is a person that only has one condition or only has the other, but, but often when they come to specialty clinics, we really have to be aggressive in, in unlocking all of those conditions. So. And then the other question I thought I would bring up is about um, cytolytic vaginitis. No, vaginosis. You see, I even get it wrong. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts about that? No one wants it. I, I can take it. I threw it up onto the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying not to, but... Well, uh, in my my perspective, that's uh, an important diagnosis to be kept in mind. And obviously our view is biased because we're getting referrals. They um, candidize that goes away with uh, fluconazole, with one pill of fluconazole or one week of clotrimazole. We are not seeing those. Uh, probably no one is seeing them because they are self-treated with uh, over-the-count medication. Um, the symptoms, uh, the, the problem with cytolytic vaginosis is, is that it is characterized by the overgrowth and probably uh, an overworking of, of lactobacilli. And what is assumed is that they are the good guys and they are never supposed to be to cause any any harm, which probably is not true. There is the concept that they just self-regulate themselves, that this cannot happen. We see associated with this overgrowth of lactobacilli, we tend to see that there is rupture of the epithelial cells. So we tend to see the the nucleus isolated, the, the cytoplasm, just pieces of it scattered through the through the whole microscopic slide when you do microscopy. In terms of symptoms, the most common symptom is burning. It looks quite a lot with in terms of uh, of symptoms with uh, recurrent candidiasis. They have burning that tends to be cyclical in women not taking uh, hormonal contraceptives. The symptoms start to tend to start at the time of ovulation and increase until the menses. So these are the women that just love uh, being with their period. That's when their symptoms that just disappear. They are most of them they are asymptomatic during this period. Um, all these women have been extensively treated with antifungals and probiotics without uh, without improvement. Uh, my personal belief is that um, this pattern of cytolytic vaginosis is, is something that we need during pregnancy. That's uh, something that's protective during pregnancy that we can see out of pregnancy and out of pregnancy in some women for some reason. It is symptomatic, while others just have this pattern and are asymptomatic. And if so, we just ignore it if we if we encounter it. Biggest problems with this not widely accepted. Luckily, now uh, it's included in our uh, vaginitis recommendations, and hopefully, it will help in the development and that more studies are are performed uh, on this entity. 
it is not technology. If we see the textbooks, medical school, no one is learning about it. So basically, we are still like we are in a 1955 BV candidate entry commoners and no other options. And we obviously know no, it is not, uh, it is insufficient. If we stick to those three entities, we will miss a lot of patients. It's quite common that we see these patients that looked uh, in the internet or were referred and they have already made the diagnosis themselves. They are so desperate and they research so much that they come to, a point, to the appointment saying, I believe I have cytolytic vaginosis. I need you to confirm whether or not I'm right. This happened to me just uh, last Friday. Um, then the diagnosis is pretty simple. You, you can suspect it uh, even with a gram stain, when you see the report and say, you will read that as abundant lactobacilli, it's kind of a clue using the microscope with wet mount you do the diagnosis immediately. It's uh, easy, cheap, uh, and fast. When it gets to treatment, we don't really have good options at, at the moment. Our best option is to use sodium bicarbonate, which probably acts into, you can use it either as seeds pads or as irrigations. If you are unsure of the diagnosis, I don't think you should ever use um, irrigations. If you are sure of the diagnosis, I believe it's okay to do it. By doing that, you 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 will increase the the pH, decreasing the the symptoms, and also probably by the washing effect, you reduce the amount of bacteria in the vagina, and that also contribute to to increasing the the pH. Then what happens to each woman is uh, quite diverse. Some will improve and stay well after a couple of weeks. Some will have symptoms for uh, months and if, or even uh, for, for years. Usually what you see is that they will reach their peak and then the symptoms tend to be less intensive, less common. And with time, it just goes away. And in the menopause, and if not using estrogens, it just doesn't exist. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm mindful that, as usual, good things have to come to an end. It's so annoying when you're having a good time and then you look at the time for the clock and you're thinking, oh, come off it. You didn't spend that, you know. But thank you so much. I have to say thank you so much to all my panelists, Ola from Ireland, Pedro from Portugal, Federica from Turin, Italy. Jill from Maryland, USA, mm -hmm. <laughs> and Melissa from Dallas, USA. Thank you so, so much. It's been a wonderful time having you on board. I have to say this again. Thank you for coming on board despite the short notice, taking time out of your very busy schedules. I'm really very grateful. I also would like to express my gratitude to the ISSVD because they've actually provided this platform in order for us to educate and empower women to take action against vulvar vaginitis. You know, it's no longer acceptable, you know, for a woman to suffer in silence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, vulva, the vulva comes in again. <laughs> it's no longer acceptable for women to suffer in silence. There's so much information available to you. You can join the organization. There's a lot of resources online webinars youtube you know just name it social media and of course i bring again that book anybody intentional about vulva vaginitis should have this book on their shelf sincerely it's a very good book you know you can download this uh yes you can download this uh, free for this very short period of time because i have a feeling we're going to run out very soon. So take opportunity now and download it. And then, of course, we're going to be having a Congress next year in um, Slovenia, 2024, September 13 to 18, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm sure it will be a wonderful time of learning, you know, networking and just getting invigorated with everything vulva disease. And to my audience, to the 76, 80 of you that have stayed behind, I have to say a huge, huge thank you. You could have done something else different with your time, but you stayed on, you know, to be with us. Thank you very, very much. And I'm quite surprised. I was expecting there to be some computer glitches, but I'm um, very surprised. I'm really happy about that. So please join us. We want more hands on deck. 
you know, with the ISSVD, go onto the website, join, be a part of it, be a part of the change, you know, and let's see you hopefully in Slovenia and make use of all the resources available to you via the ISSVD. Thank you so much. But before I go, I'll just ask one more question from all my panelists. Is there anything else you'd like to add? A pattern short, a pattern note. It could be even Latin. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, suppose, I suppose it's really to reiterate what you said on behalf of the ISSVD, they're, they have a massive resource there, which is really good for patients and clinicians but also for women just to be more aware of their vulva and if they have any concerns at all, you know, to see, to have to seek advice, to see their GP or their family doctor, because, you know, it, it can have such a massive impact on their quality of life as well as their relationship with their partner. Certainly, certainly, certainly. And I, I think agree with Orla and I just wish that it was more commonplace that people felt like they could talk about their vulvar disease. I mean, you know, their friends are probably have similar diseases, but they don't talk about it or just look and know some names so that they're comfortable to bring up problems to their physicians because everyone has the same issues. Mm -hmm. We're all pretty much built the same. So there's nothing to be ashamed of genitally in your with your genitals. Yeah. I mean, one of my patients, for example, she's a, a language teacher and she is uh, so she's fluent in Italian and Spanish. And she said she reads women's magazines in English, in Spanish and Italian. And she's never read anything about lichen sclerosis. She said, why are we, why do women in all these countries not talk about it? And it is so true. Wow. 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 This wow. is our mission. It's our yeah. goal to spread awareness and let people be confident with their selves to talk to us. Certainly, 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 certainly. Thank you all. And one last note, if you can examine your breast, if you can reverberate your face, as by, you know, having facials, I see no reason why you can't examine your vulva at least once a month. Once a month. It's not too hard. It's not a difficult task. Thank you. And on that note, ciao.